Welcome everyone to the first colloquium of the Environmental Sciences Department in this new spring semester. And I can't think of a better way to begin our colloquium series than by welcoming Jim Harkness to be our first speaker. Jim has 25 years of really rich experience with environmental sustainability, biodiversity conservation, and food security uh, issues with bo in both China as well as the US. But I should say that personally, I know Jim from long before he became an expert in all of these things. We were both in the same batch of graduate students at Cornell and uh, Jim and I shared a number of classes and an office. But the highlight of it was that Jim was an ace, is an ace bird watcher and took us on wonderful trips around the, uh, that part of upstate New York. Jim then went on to do a study in Tibet where he'd already um, you know, lived and worked in China for some time, but he did a study in Tibet on the black neck crane, a very endangered bird on which um, very little was known at that time. And uh, he followed that up with a study uh, which was his master's thesis of the Three Gorges Dam in India and the debate about a uh, Three Gorges Dam in China on the Yangtze River and the debate about science, democracy, and decision making. Since then, Jim went on to work in China for long periods of uh, time, first with Ford Foundation and then with WWF. And he has more recently spent seven years as the president of the Minneapolis-based Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. Jim is currently the China country director of the National Geographical Society. So welcome, Jim. It's a pleasure to have you here. And thank you so much for waking up at the crack of dawn to speak to us today um, from Minneapolis. Amita, is it fully shared? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. Over the past 40 years, China has experienced explosive economic growth and social change, all of which has come with terrible costs to its natural environment. But there have always been people who have worked to save China's natural heritage. Scientists, um, Scientists concerned about biodiversity loss, high officials worried about depleting the nation's resources, and ordinary citizens acting out of love for their country's wildlife and natural beauty. Their efforts, their successes and failures are what I want to talk about today. Now, the vast majority of these people are Chinese, but I'm the one telling the story, so I'm sure I will end up overrepresenting foreign groups like the ones that I've worked with, including WWF, uh, the International Crane Foundation and others. But I think that's okay because outside scientists and conservationists have played a role. And because I believe we should all be supporting China's efforts to protect its rich biodiversity, because after all, that's part of our global natural heritage. I'll focus more on protection of wildlife and ecosystems rather than on things like reducing toxic pollution or greenhouse gas emissions. But I think that the trends and dynamics I discuss apply pretty well across different environmental issues. Even with this narrowed focus, of course, there are far too many issues for me to cover in the time we have together. And I don't know which things might be most of interest to you. So uh, as Professor Babaskar mentioned, I'll try to limit my uh, remarks to 45 minutes or so, so that we have time for questions and discussion afterwards. China, like India, is a mega diversity country. It has the third largest number of plant and animal species in the entire, in the entire world. An important reason for this is the country's topography. Specifically, these high mountain ranges in the southwest part of the country, uh, which would correspond to the eastern Himalayas, um, these high mountain ridges and deep subtropical valleys during successive ice ages over the past few million years served as refuges for numerous ancient species of plants and animals that had been found all over Eurasia, 
but were wiped out everywhere else by the advance of the glaciers. This topography also promoted the evolution of new species by isolating subpopulations that then grew farther and farther apart. As a result of this geology and natural history, China, which is about the size of the US, has twice as many plants and animals as the US and Canada do combined. It also has a huge diversity of ecosystems from tropical forests to glaciers, to coral reefs, to deserts, to the highest point on the planet. So when we talk about wildlife in China, we're not just talking about pandas. And all those plants and animals are sharing a national territory with the world's largest human population and with an economy that has grown by double digits for much of the period I'm discussing. So you can imagine the challenge that China's conservationists have been up against. Nature conservation in modern China really doesn't start until after the death of Mao Zedong in 1976. Keep in mind that during the entire period from 1949 to 76, China had a Soviet style planned economy in place of market mechanisms or traditional community systems of exchange, or structures for caring for people and managing resources. The state attempted to exert complete control over all aspects of the economy moving people, investment, and resources around to try to meet big targets for things like food security or industrial production. In the 1950s, there were some major successes in China. A massive land reform ended famine and met the basic needs of most of China's people in just a few short years. And public health and literacy campaigns yielded similarly remarkable results. The environment did not fare so well, though. In this period, nature was seen in two ways as an enemy to be tamed, and as a stock of resources to fuel China's industrialization. For instance, vast forests were chopped down during the Great Leap Forward in the 1950s to provide fuel for a failed scheme to try to build a steel mill in every single village in China. And forested hillsides were again stripped bare in the 1960s and 70s so that terraces could be built as part of a national grain growing campaign that also ended in failure. During this period, there was no official recognition that nature might have some value other than as an input to economic growth. One of Mao's famous slogans was Ren Ding Sheng Tian, or man must conquer nature. Wild animals were seen as pests that spread disease and compete with humans for food. So there were no limits on hunting, trapping, or poisoning of wildlife. To the contrary, a public health campaign to control rats, flies, and mosquitoes was expanded to take in birds as well. As you can see from this poster, exhorting children to build socialism by killing sparrows with their slingshots. After Mao's death in 1976, Deng Xiaoping rose to leadership in China and initiated what has become known as the reform and opening period. Deng gradually loosened restrictions on private economic activities and he reconnected China to the global economy. Under Deng, China also took the first serious steps toward conservation of nature but the economic forces he unleashed brought new and even greater pressures on the environment. Like Mao, Deng saw nature as a raw material for human use, but that he felt that it must be managed more sustainably. And the failed campaigns under Mao that had denuded China's forests were not just bad for wildlife, but brought erosion and desertification and ended up hurting China's food production. In response, Deng committed China to massive tree planting programs to try to stabilize soil and water, especially in the North and West. Millions of people were mobilized, but these campaigns were poorly designed and there was often no care for the trees after they were planted. So in the end, little was accomplished from this huge expenditure of effort. A Chinese forester once told me that if all those trees had actually survived, they would have covered the whole country 10 times over. This kind of simplistic engineering solution to ecological problems was a holdover from the old command economy. And it wasn't until the 1990s that less heavy-handed approaches started to gain acceptance. The signal achievement for wildlife protection in China during this era was the huge increase in nature reserves. And it happened due to the work of China's beleaguered biological scientists. Now, scientists had been attacked as elitists under Mao, many of them sent off to internal exile or forced labor but the post-Mao leadership rehabilitated science and expertise, and in 1979, passed major forest and environmental protection laws. In 1980, 2,500 botanists and zoologists 
from the Chinese Academy of Sciences were sent out across the country in search of unique and threatened species and ecosystems in need of protection. And by 1981, 100 new nature reserves had been established. By 1998, the number of protected areas in China grew to over 800. At a time when it was still a very poor country and one with a growing demand for natural resources to fuel its development, this was a really remarkable commitment by China to preserve nature for future generations. In the 1980s and 90s, China's economy boomed. Because commerce was encouraged and China was reconnected to global markets, supply chains could extend all the way from the most remote mountain village to Shanghai or even beyond. Wildlife trade exploded as a result, often for export, and it had devastating impacts on many species. In 1987, for instance, a large shipment of Chinese musk, which is extracted from the tiny musk glands of musk deer, was confiscated in Japan. Authorities there estimated that the amount seized corresponded to the slaughter of over 100,000 animals. During this time, demand skyrocketed in the West for a cloth called shatush that those of you in India have probably heard of. Shatush is said to be many times softer than the finest pashmina, but it doesn't come from sheep or goats. Instead, it's made from the undercoat of the Tibetan antelope, which is pictured here. And the animals must be killed in order to extract it. Hundreds of thousands of these antelope were shot and skinned over just about a 10 year period in scenes recalling the slaughter of North American bison in the, 19, in the 1800s. Their hides were smuggled over the border for processing in Kashmir, where there had been, and where there had been a million antelope in Tibet earlier in the 20th century. There were just 75,000 left by the mid 1990s. The opening part of reform and opening refers to China's re-engagement, not only with the global economy, but its greater openness to the outside world in general. And one aspect of that was the entry of environmental organizations like WWF and others, starting in the 1980s. I'd like to talk about one of the earliest international conservation projects in China, which was the reintroduction of Pear David's deer. Pear David's deer is a small deer that historically lived in marshes in the central Yangtze River Valley but went extinct in the wild in the late 19th century. A hundred years later though, Pear David's deer miraculously reappeared in China. It turned out that a few of the deer had been captured in the 1800s and shipped to private menageries in Europe for display. In 1985, the 14th Duke of Bedford, and I'm not kidding when I say that, was persuaded by WWF to donate a few dozen deer from his private herd so that the species might be reestablished back in China. At first, these deer were kept in a breeding farm outside of Beijing, and then they were transferred to enclosures in protected areas, uh, neighboring protected areas in their historical home in the Yangtze Valley. Now, there was a lot of concern at the time that because they were descended from such a small captive population and had been out of their native habitat for so long, the deer would have physical problems from inbreeding or they would have lost the ability to survive in the wild. But apparently nobody told that to the deer. The next time the Yangtze River flooded, they swam out of their enclosures and settled back into their original habitat. There are now over 50 small herds of Pear David's deer in the wild in the central Yangtze. And a couple of thousand captive animals are found in various zoos and breeding centers in and outside of China. The crested ibis is another wetland species that has returned from the brink of extinction, thanks in part to international cooperation. This ibis was once widespread in Northeast Asia, but due to habitat loss, hunting, and the use of pesticides, by 1981, the last six wild birds that were known at the time were captured in Japan in the hope that they could be bred in captivity. But while Japan's last ibis were dying out, there was actually a desperate search underway in China to try to rediscover this lost species. Scientist Liu Yunzeng of the Chinese uh, Institute of Zoology had spent six years traveling on foot or by bicycle through the remote foothills of the Qinling Mountains in Shanxi province, asking farmers whether they had seen this bird. And in May, 1981, he found several of them, including a nesting pair. The, crest is, the crested ibis is considered sacred in Japan. And after the bird's rediscovery in China, 
the Japanese government provided millions of dollars of financing as well as technical support to help this bird, uh, help the Chinese um, restore this bird that had almost disappeared forever. Today, there are over 2,000 crested ibises in China. Uh, and ibises have even been reintroduced back into the wild in Japan. It's a very good example of how a shared commitment to a higher cause can build bridges between countries that don't generally get along. Now, the most famous Chinese animal is, of course, the giant panda. Uh, Amita mentioned my work for WWF. A few slides back, we saw the WWF flag with the panda logo. And of course, when I was at WWF in Beijing, we had a major panda conservation program. It would have looked very bad for us as a conservation organization if we had let our logo go extinct. I also actually served uh, for a couple of years as the US Zoo Association's Giant Panda Action Plan Coordinator. So I have, in short, a lot of experience with giant pandas. And much as I would like to tell a straightforward story about, how the, histor about the history of efforts to save the panda, I have found that there are some deep misconception misconceptions among the public about this animal. And as someone with a personal history and a stake in the species, I feel I need to uh, take a little time to set the record straight. Because we all know how adorable pandas are, but the fact is they've been getting bad press for a long time. As you can see, panda bashing is actually quite fashionable these days. These aren't just fringe views. The first of these headlines is actually describing the views of a popular BBC presenter. This type of anti-panda propaganda is based in misconceptions about the animals and more generally about how to save all endangered animals. The first of these myths is that pandas are a sort of evolutionary dead end, a freak of nature that's bad at reproducing and has an over-specialized diet of bamboo that's not nutritious enough for such a large animal. By this logic, we're actually going against nature by keeping this dead end species alive when it should have gone extinct long ago. The second idea is that because they're so adorable, pandas hog all of the conservation resources that might be better spent on less charismatic species like slugs or jellyfish that have just as much right to exist as they do. Well, the problem with both of these ideas is that they're based on a particular idea about conservation. The notion that the best or only way to save a species is the way we save the crested ibis and the pear david's deer by breeding them in captivity and then releasing them back into nature. But in fact, captive breeding should really only be a last resort when there are so few individuals left in when there are so few individuals left in the wild and they are in so much danger that there is no alternative. The truth about pandas is very different depending on whether we're talking about them in the wild or in captivity. Wild pandas like this one are able to eat and make little pandas quite nicely. Because they have no natural predators and live in forests with abundant bamboo, it's actually quite efficient for them to spend 10 to 12 hours a day on their backs, munching on their vegetarian diet. And the reproductive success of wild pandas is about the same as it is for some populations of black bears. That's me, and this is 1994, when I had the good fortune to see and even feed some bamboo shoots uh, to a panda in the mountains of Southwest China because of some intrepid biologists from Peking University who had been studying the animal for most of its life. It was exhilarating and kind of scary to be that close to a wild animal of that size. Uh, and as you can see with such large teeth, but I still remember that the entire day from when we started up the mountain to when we finally found the panda to when we returned to camp, we were never out of earshot of the sound of axes chopping away at the forest. Because of course, the real threat to pandas is not their own faulty wiring, but human destruction of their habitat. This brings us to that other myth about pandas, that they are hog scarce conservation funding that would be better spent on other species. Well, the fact is that the panda's habitat, the forests of the upper Yangtze, is the most biologically diverse temperate forest on the entire earth and it's home to more plant and animal species than all of the US and Canada. By protecting pandas, China is also caring for all of the other species in, in this highly diverse and threatened ecosystem. 
These are just a few of those species that are found nowhere else on the planet and might be extinct if they didn't share the forest with pandas. If we assume captive breeding is the only way to save pandas, then the complaints and the myths make a little more sense. In such an artificial and intrusive setting as a zoo, it's not surprising that pandas have had more difficulty with reproduction. And creating enclosures that can mimic a high mountain forest in a zoo in London or Mexico City is expensive. But zoos want the status and revenues that come from exhibiting pandas. So they have come up with the idea that we must breed pandas in captivity in order to save them. And this is the most important myth that I think we need to bust. The fact is, even though zoos have gotten somewhat better at breeding pandas, there's no evidence that all of their efforts are helping the species. And efforts to reintroduce captive pandas back into the wild have pretty much failed. Fortunately, China's commitment to protecting the forests of the upper Yangtze has paid off. The logging company that was chopping down that forest on that day in 1994, when I fed the wild panda, was closed down once the presence of pandas was confirmed at that site. And most of the species' remaining habitat is now under protection. As a result, the wild population of pandas has increased to the point where the species has actually now been downgraded from endangered to threatened. Now back to the rest of nature. If the expansion of the protected area system in the 1980s was a major accomplishment of this early reform and opening period in China, one of the biggest challenges during that time was operating all of those nature reserves. As the number of protected areas grew into the hundreds, financial and management responsibility for the reserves was mostly left in the hands of local governments. And this was a huge burden for them. Most nature reserves were in poor areas where the same isolation that had slowed the destruction of nature also served as a barrier to economic development. So local governments desperate to feed their people and generate jobs often just could not take on the additional burden of staffing and managing um, protected areas. By 1994, it was reported that one third of China's nature reserves were still just paper parks, meaning they only had a name and a circle on a map, on a map but had no staff or operating budget. During this time, ecotourism was promoted by foreign NGOs and the Chinese government as a way to, for protected areas to raise money for conservation. But as experiences all over the world have shown, ecotourism planning and management is extremely difficult. Most, project e most projects either failed or succeeded too well, attracting so many people uh, like this uh, nature walk in uh, Hunan province, that the pressure on natural habitats became unbearable. One Chinese researcher claimed that the pressure on the forest from tourism in the Wolong Panda Reserve, including things like garbage and air and water pollution, road building, cutting of fuel wood, and collection of wild plants and animals for serving in restaurants, was doing more damage to the forest than the logging company that had managed the forest before it became a reserve. Unfortunately, I have to confess that foreign NGOs sometimes contributed to this idea of nature reserves going into the tourism business to cover their costs. And I can say from firsthand experience that there were many failed NGO ecotourism projects around this time. And, and the fiscal crisis of China's protected area system continued on well into the 2000s. A huge shift happened in the philosophy and behavior of the Chinese government toward nature in 1998. Up to that time, aside from plantations to control deserts in the arid Northwest, forests in China were seen as valuable only for their timber. But by the 1990s, Chinese scientists began to notice that as natural forests dwindled, the frequency and severity of floods on China's mightiest river, the Yangtze, were increasing. The Three Gorges Dam, completed in 1997, had been touted as a comprehensive solution to the problem of flooding on the Yangtze. But the very next summer, in 1998, the provinces downstream of the dam suffered from the biggest floods in half a century. 4,000 people died, and the damage was estimated at over 40 billion US dollars. After the flood, China's government banned logging in the entire Yangtze River watershed and overnight changed the mission of its forestry ministry from logging to conservation. State-owned logging and forest products companies employing several million workers 
would have to be repurposed or closed. Premier Zhurongji alluded to this challenge poetically by saying, now we must coax the forest tiger down from the mountains. I always love that quote. Over the next few years, China implemented a huge program to pay tens of millions of farmers living in steep mountain areas to plant trees instead of crops on their hillsides. And in arid areas, they paid farmers to allow farmland to go fallow so that natural grasslands could recover. They also moved thousands of farmers out of flood prone lowlands along the Yangtze, areas that then became flood storage basins. A new notion that researchers and environmentalists had quietly been promoting for years took hold. The idea that natural systems have a value to society beyond the provision of raw materials for industry. Now, all of this, this dramatic change began in the summer and fall of 1998. And at the end of that year, I was fortunate enough to be hired as the new country representative in China for the World Wildlife Fund. In hindsight, I feel so lucky because the years when I was with WWF in China uh, turned out to be a sort of golden age for environment and conservation there. Uh, not, not because of me, but because of this larger historical context that I'm telling you about. The government that had been so conservative that had not been able to afford to fund protected areas, that had argued that as a developing country, China should grow its economy first and then think about the environment. The same government was all of a sudden taking radical steps to restore and protect natural systems. And because this dramatic change in direction was bringing unintended consequences and new problems, the officials who were tasked with solving these problems were more and more open to new ideas. I think part of the reason they were willing to listen was that so many of the new ideas were now coming from Chinese people. Foreign NGOs, including WWF, had used almost exclusively Western staff and consultants in the 1980s. And this could lead to misunderstandings and distrust on both sides. By the late 90s, though, I found there was a new generation of idealistic, cosmopolitan, brilliant young Chinese who had gotten degrees abroad and wanted to come back to help their country, or who had gained experience in business or government and wanted to try a new way of working. This is a picture of, picture of Mr. Liu Xiaohai, who worked on WWF's community-based sustainable development projects. In, actually, in Panda Habitat, he brought an understanding of business to his work. He had actually worked in organic farming before. And he also brought a conviction that in addition to helping the environment, our projects had to help local communities to pay their bills. Xiaohai used participatory approaches to develop a diverse economic port portfolio of activities based on the skills and interests in the communities themselves, including things like homestays and traditional products like organic honey. Another exciting aspect of the late 1990s and 2000s in China was the growing interest in nature among China's middle classes. A whole generation of new urbanites, people who had been desperate to get out of the countryside, found the advantages of city life were offset by choking smog, overcrowding, contaminated food, and a lack of green space. As a result, public interest in, in things like nature hikes and other outdoor activities exploded. When WWF's communication team set up an online bulletin board for people to talk about nature activities and people who are old will, will remember, remember those BBS bulletin boards in the early days of the internet? Well, our, our nature bulletin board immediately became a center for organizing offline excursions and projects all over China. Bird watching was especially popular. And a field guide to the birds of China that we commissioned immediately sold out and has now been through many, many printings. But of course, foreign NGOs were not the only ones working with China's new middle classes. In the mid 1990s, a famous writer named Liang Chongjie became a spokesperson for the environmental concerns of China's growing middle class. Liang founded China's first environmental NGO, Friends of Nature to organize nature education activities and outings and to provide an independent Chinese voice on environmental issues. Independent organizations were viewed with a lot of suspicion by the Chinese authorities, where friends of nature tread carefully, taking up causes such as the plight of the Tibetan antelope that were both popular and in line with government policy. Liang himself could be more provocative. He once 
he was once derided for calling on the city of Beijing to move the massive capital iron and steel works, one of the city's largest employers because of its belching smokestacks. But a few years later, in the run-up to the 2008 Beijing Olympics, the city ended up doing just that. During this period, there was a noticeable recovery of nature in many areas of China. Part of this was due to better enforcement and new policies, but part of it was simply the result of urbanization. Here in the US, historians tell us that there is now more forest in the eastern part of the US than there has been in over 300 years. And that's because even though there are more people than ever, they're almost all in cities. So forests have had a chance to grow back. Well, something similar happened in rural areas all over China over the past 30 years. In the hills around Beijing, where forests have had a chance to regrow as farmers moved into the city, leopards have been seen for the first time in 50 years. The image here on the left is Mr. Xiong Arfeng, a farmer I lived with while I was doing crane research in central China in 1988. And those are his farm fields in the background. 30 years later, in 2018, I went back for a visit and I found old Xiong was still there, aged 86, but had retired and was living entirely off of remittances from his children who now work in factories on the coast. I was shocked to find that the fields surrounding his village were, had been abandoned over 20 years ago and now have completely grown back into forests. But of course, city folk and especially wealthier city folk tend to end up putting more pressure on the environment through their demand for energy and other resources. The protection and restoration of nature inside China as the country has urbanized has actually ended up coinciding with a huge increase in China's environmental footprint overall. This slide is of the Pudong district of Shanghai, which was just a scattering of villages and rice paddies until the 1980s and has since been transformed by industrial and real estate investment into the ultra modern cityscape you see. China, one of the poorest countries on earth on a per capita basis just a few decades ago, now has a middle class of over 400 million people. Their demand, the, the demand for resources to feed, clothe, house, and entertain this new middle class stretches far beyond China's borders. Whereas China had a plant-based diet well into the 1990s, it is now the world's largest meat-eating country. Its imports of agricultural products, especially for animal feed, have become a key driver of deforestation in other countries. China now imports two-thirds of all of the soybeans traded on global markets, and about half of those come from Brazil, grown on land that used to be rainforest. As this slide shows, four million hectares of rainforest were converted to soy production in just five years from 2000 to 2005. China is second only to India in its imports of palm oil, most of it grown on land that was formerly tropical forest in Indonesia and Malaysia. And China has become a net importer of wildlife products, wild fish and seafood, as well as forest and timber products. This externalizing, externalizing of environmental destruction is not something that China invented. Japan has maintained a staggering 77% forest cover for decades, but they did so by restricting domestic logging and instead denuding Southeast Asian countries of their forests. And in the 1980s, American environmentalists learned that our taste for hamburgers was destroying the Amazon as fast food chains turned to importing cheap Brazilian beef raised on recently deforested land. From 2012 to the present, China has had a new supreme leader, Xi Jinping. And unlike Mao, who wanted to defeat nature, Xi has pledged to build China into what he calls an ecological civilization. Xi Jinping is known for his saying, written here in Chinese, that, quote unquote, green mountains and blue waters are like mountains of silver and gold. And in case there was any doubt about his meaning, he also said, we value both natural landscapes and resources, as well as material wealth. The former overrides and promises the latter. And indeed, under Xi, China has doubled down on investments in protecting nature. 
In addition to prohibitions on hunting and trapping of endangered wildlife on land, China has now banned commercial fishing on the Yangtze, Huai, and several other major rivers, as well as much of its territorial marine waters. About 18% of China's national territory is now under some form of protected status. There are almost 3,000 nature reserves. Some formerly endangered species are showing signs of recovery. I mentioned the change in the giant panda status to vulnerable, and there's been similar improvements and increases in the populations of the Amur tiger, crested ibis, Tibetan antelope, and Yangtze alligator. China also continues to make progress in restoring forest and grassland cover. And in place of the old tree planting campaigns, something called payments for ecosystem services have become an important mechanism for channeling government funds to environmentally sensitive areas and for rewarding local communities and farmers who maintain things like natural vegetative cover. A new set of ecological red lines are being drawn to protect the environment outside of nature reserves through functional zoning. For instance, polluting industries will be banned altogether in the next few years from constructing new plants within a kilometer of the Yangtze River and its major tributaries. And existing plants will be relocated to designated industrial development zones. China has also invested some of its new wealth in financing its protected area system. When I worked in nature reserves in the 1980s, staff were usually laid off loggers who had very little equipment or training in conservation. Returning to some of those same protected areas in the last five years, I've been stunned to find young staff with graduate degrees in biology using state-of-the-art camera traps and remote sensing technology for their work. A few years ago, while I was bird watching <laughs> in the hills outside of Beijing, I ran into this. And I'm hoping that I can share it with you. If your, if your Mandarin is a little rusty, um, this is a motion activated um, a loudspeaker uh, informing me that I am uh, informing me on behalf of the Beijing Forest Police that I am entering a class one protected forest area and reminding me that um, smoking and fire are prohibited in the area. And protect and create a beautiful home for all. And then the sign on the other side uh, of, the, of, of the pole um, uh, lays out what the fines are for various violations like um, littering, et cetera, and gives an emergency number to call if you want to report other people who are doing damage to uh, the park. So clearly, and this was really literally out in the middle of nowhere, up the, the, the lengths that um, authorities are going to around China uh, to try to protect uh, and restore their natural areas. Now, despite the huge turnaround that I've talked about in conservation in China in the past decade, some really terrible losses have continued because of historical damage to forests and rivers combined with climate change. Even recent programs to restore forests and wetlands haven't been enough to prevent some natural disasters and species declines. In the past few years, the giant paddlefish and the species pictured here, the Baiji um, uh, uh, river dolphin have gone extinct. And the river and the giant softshell turtle may join them soon. Over half of China's reptile species and about 45% of its amph amphibians are endangered. More importantly for human beings, there's been a huge decline in the wild populations of many medicinal plant species. And as China's agriculture is industrializing, there's been a huge loss of the country's rich domesticated animal and crop diversity. 
The severe Yangtze floods last summer did not lead to as much loss of life as in 1998. But because there's been so much development along the river in the past 20 years, the financial losses were much, much greater over, at over 100 billion US dollars. But right now, China's greatest environmental challenges may be outside her borders, where China's demand for resources and its investments in major construction projects have global scale impacts on species and ecosystems. As these headlines show, there's a growing backlash against China because of its claims over natural resources around the world, from mines in Africa to soy imports from Brazil to armed fishing fleets that frequently trespass into other countries' territorial waters. So what does the future hold? Well, as I've implied through my remarks, some of the dynamics in environment and society in China echo what has happened in other countries. There's a period of intensive and destructive resource exploitation, the rise of a middle class and environmental concerns, strengthening of domestic nature protection, aided in part by displacement of resource demand under, onto other countries. So where does that leave us in 2021? Well, one big difference between China and the West is that there is no large organized civil society to pressure either government or the private sector in China on environmental issues. For instance, I'm stunned by how effective the European youth movement was in pushing political leaders of the EU to adopt such an aggressive and ambitious climate action plan in the last couple of years. In China, there's no equivalent of this. As a result, I think that in general, outsiders think that China's leaders really aren't influenced at all by their citizens and don't respond either to criticisms from other countries. But I don't think it's that simple. You know, China has many dynamics that are similar to other countries in terms of the stages of development where first there's a over exploitation of resources during a period of rapid growth. Um, then you have the rise of a middle class and increasing environmental concern. And then this stage where there's a strengthening of domestic nature conservation, um, but that in turn gets aided by a displacement of environmental damage onto other countries. Um, but one important difference between China and certainly China and the West and, and many other countries is that there is no large organized civil society to pressure either the government or the private sector in China on environmental issues. I mean, looking at Europe, I've been stunned by the effectiveness of the youth climate movement there to push political leaders into a, a very radical and ambitious climate action plan in the last several years. There's nothing equivalent to that happening uh, in China. And I think as a result of, of the nature of China's political system, outsiders tend to think that China's leaders aren't influenced at all by their citizens and don't respond either to criticisms from other countries. I don't think it's quite that simple. There is a social contract of sorts in China and the Chinese Communist Party, as I mentioned, has now explicitly recognized solving environmental problems as one of the obligations it has to its people. China also has more respect for international institutions than my own country and is a signatory to all major global environmental agreements. They're going to host the next meeting of the UN Convention on Biodiversity later this year. And I think that we can expect some major new commitments from China to come out of that conference. China has also initiated a, a greening the Belt and Road program, which is meant to um, improve the reputation of its overseas um, infrastructure and, and other investments. And I think if that happens, it would be a really important step toward China taking more responsibility for some of the environmental impacts of um, but the global environmental impacts of its economic growth. So I would just end my formal remarks on that note of hope. Thank you so much, Jim. That was an absolutely fabulous overview.